Good evening and welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, here with you for another half hour of politics and current events from a libertarian perspective. And my guest tonight is Jim Lashinsky, a longtime libertarian activist and the author of the new book that's uh, coming out this winter, The Walton Street Tycoons. Um, Jim, tell us about this book. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Uh, the Walton Street Tycoons is a libertarian novel for young adults. Uh, it's aimed at uh, the uh, middle school readers, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, I think is the target audience. Although, from what I've been told by people who've read it, is that it's a, a book much like uh, Robert Heinlein's Juveniles that adults enjoy just as much as kids. Um, it's not written down to, to kids, it's written about kids. and. Uh, in a way that respects them, and it's, I think it's a, a fun, engaging story, and um, you know, I think it's a good read. Okay, now if you were to explain libertarian principles to that age group, the uh, 10 to 14 age group, how would you explain it? You know, I, I would say that, you know, in short, it's the rules of the playground, you know, just you know, leave other people alone that aren't bothering you, don't take other people's stuff, uh, you know, don't start fights, if someone starts a fight, you can finish them, and uh, you'll just, Anything goes as long as you're not bothering anybody else, and usually it's like the people that are bothering other other people are are the troublemakers and or the or the adults or the teachers, <laughs> and uh, you know it's uh, really just a philosophy of just live and let live. Okay. Which I think uh, you know kids are probably more predisposed to understanding that than a lot of adults that get conditioned into uh, statist uh, mind, uh, minding other people's business mentality. Okay. Um, but I've found that um, kids these days are being conditioned by uh, various authority figures, mostly in the schools, to submit to authority, to, uh, and they're taught that the, um, the collectivist idea is the only valid idea. So uh, this book of yours, The Walton Street Tycoons, goes against that, correct? It definitely does. It's a very politically incorrect novel, a very... Um a lot of ways very out of step with um, contemporary uh, ideas and, and values, but uh, you know, there's a lot of traditional values, but also I think a lot of timeless values that are in there. Okay, well what are some of the ideas that it puts forth that would scandalize a, a good democratic mother or father? Uh, let's see, well let's see, uh, kids like guns, um, for, for starters. Uh, well, kids do like guns. Yeah, yes, you know, that's shocking. You know, we, we all played with guns when we were kids, but somehow today, you know, apparently, you know, if, you, if you draw a gun or even talk about guns in school, you're going to be down at the... the toy gun you're talking about. A toy gun, yeah, yeah. You're, you're going to be, or even, yeah, just draw a picture of somebody, you know, shooting a gun. Uh, you're going to be down at the principal's office or the counselor's office. Uh, these kids You'd are... You'd probably be in jail, as a matter of fact. Yeah, yeah. And, you know... It could be a threat, you know, drawing a picture of somebody shooting a gun could be perceived as a threat and often is nowadays for some reason. My gosh, when I was a kid, I used to draw pictures of my teachers hanging from the gallows all the time. Oh, yeah. I'd be in prison for life if that happened today. Oh, yeah, so I used to have friends that, you know, would draw in their notebooks, you know, you know really detailed renderings of, um, you know, uh, soldiers shooting uh, submachine guns and, you know, and, and, and playing uh, cops and robbers and cowboys and Indians and, I, or Native Americans, you know, we called them Indians back when I was a kid. But I still call them Indians. <laughs> okay, and uh, so you, know, you, you have that. Um, capitalism is a, is a big theme in the book. Uh, that it, it's okay to be greedy and to make a profit and to, you know, to um, and that you know some people are smarter and more driven and more talented than others. You know, we don't. Not everybody has equal self-esteem, nor should they. You know, some people are actually um, achieve more than others. That's okay. Okay, well, without giving us too much of the plot, can you tell us a little about what takes place in this book and why, sure. why people would find uh, it interesting? Yeah, yeah. The Walton Street Tycoon uh, takes place on Walton Street in um, uh, upstate uh, New York fictional town called Walton, New York. And like much of upstate New York, it's uh, economically depressed. Uh, whatever business and industry had been there had left, has left and is, or is fleeing. And, you know, the kids there... You know, seeing their, their parents unemployed and out of work and wanting some money, they start their own little businesses. And uh, you know, the interesting thing about about the kids' economy is it doesn't have all those things like like taxes and regulations and all the things that get in the way of um, people prospering in, in the above ground economy. And you know, surprisingly, the, these kids start making a lot of money. And, and of course, there are a lot of people that aren't aren't happy when somebody else is successful. 
whether it's other kids or, or grown-ups. And so a lot of the, uh, the plot and the humor and the tension in the book is what happens with these, with these various people, whether they're peers or teachers or parents or government, resents people that are successful and you know, tries to get in their way. Okay, so um, when you um, have this, um, these capitalistic kids out there making money, are they uh, more or less honest and ethical? Well, or, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's definitely, you know, I try to make them well-rounded and human. It's not, you know, one of the things I, I always found troubling about a lot of Ayn Rand's books, which I thought, are, you know, obviously, are great books, Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead, you know, are wonderful libertarian books and have a lot to teach, but a lot of the characters, especially the protagonists, are, I've always thought were very two-dimensional and heroic, larger than life. And it's good to have heroes, but you know they should be rounded and human. So, so I think my characters and my protagonists, you know, they're definitely flawed kids, but overall, they're you know they're very moral, and you know they get to the extent that they're successful and and uh, become become wealthy and, and and successful is because of they're, they're they're good business people and they're honest and they're giving a, delivering a good product. Okay, one of the problems that I often encounter when um, <coughs> when I'm talking about libertarianism to, um, to children and teenagers is that they have been conditioned to believe that collectivists are the good, morally upright, ethical people and that um, libertarians are uh, just uh, selfish and cruel and don't give a rat's ass for anybody else. Yeah. Um, well, that's all true. Do you <laughs> <laughs> but no, but seriously, I, I guess that there, uh, in all seriousness, there are libertarians that are, are selfish, and you know that's okay as long as you know, you're not hurting anybody else. But you know, what, as Adam Smith taught us in, in *The Wealth of Nations*, it's not because of any benevolence that we have wealth and make other people happier. It's out of self-interest. Right. And when when people have self-interest and act in that self-interest in an ethical, honest way. It makes everybody better off. Yeah, and the point that I often make when I'm talking to kids and teenagers about libertarianism is that the um, do-gooder collectivist types aren't always doing it out of altruism, but just out of a desire to dominate and control other people and make people live the way they think those people ought exactly. to live. Exactly. You know, they, they know best. Uh, somebody, somebody, the idea that, that uh, somebody else knows better than you what you want and what will make you happy is you know, this idea that you know, Democrats and Republicans alike um, seem to be enamored with. Right. And another objection that I hear from a lot of kids is, well, when, when you describe your libertarian society, you seem to be assuming that everybody's going to be good. Right. And I always say, no, quite the opposite. Yeah. I don't think everybody's going to be good. I think everybody's going to be bad because people are bad, and therefore I don't want them governing my life. Right, exactly. They can be as bad as they want to be on their own as long as they leave me alone. Yeah, I mean, you, and you look at the people that that want to be in charge of other people. It's not the people that, that are good and have the best interest, everybody's best interest in heart. It's the people that, yeah, like you said, want, want to dominate other people. The people that um, you know, see somebody else having fun. When you think about the kids that used to, to snitch in school, they, they weren't you know, looking out for you because you know, if you were chewing gum, you weren't hurting anybody, but you know, just the idea that you were getting away with something that they couldn't leave well enough alone and they want to show that uh, they have power over you. Yeah, the uh, the whole monitor types, yeah, the student yeah. government types, yeah. those are the ones who grow up and go to Congress. Exactly. And, um, so it's really no wonder that our government is the mess that it is now. Uh, well, now you have uh, two small children yourself. And yeah. um, and a third on the way. A third on the way, my goodness. Don't you have a TV set? <laughs> you would think so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, in any case, of course, when they grow up, they'll make their own decisions. But do you try and instill libertarian principles in them uh, is at, at their early age? Yeah, well, that, that, that's an interesting question. I, I don't want to, you know, I I think propagandizing children is, is distasteful, so I wouldn't say I do that, but at the same time, I think the, my view of libertarianism is that it's such a, a simple, basic moral ethic, you know, the do unto others uh, golden rule that, you know, I think we do teach them that, and as they get older, I mean, I mean they become more sophisticated. They ask me questions about politics. I share my opinions with them. But just being around my wife and I, I think they, you know, they pick up certainly a lot of our values. But you know, I try to stay away from you know propagandizing them and just you know lead by example and teach them my, my values. And you know, hopefully my kids are smart enough that that they'll pick up some of that. And we also you know we have a very libertarian household. We're uh, homeschooling our daughters, so 
Uh, we're, we're keeping them out of the status, you know, government indoctrination camps that pass for public schools. And so, you know, they're avoiding a lot of the indoctrination and propagandizing that they would get from public schools, which I think is one of the main reasons that public schools exist is to indoctrinate kids into the socialist mentality. I agree. Uh, and I think that the idea of homeschooling your children is a very, very good one if you are able to do it. But let's face it, a lot of families can't. Either they don't have the know-how or they don't have the, uh, the resources and they have to send their kid to public school. And in that case, if you have libertarian sensibilities, what are some of the ways you can think of to, um, to lessen the, um, the ill effects of a public school education? I, th I think you know, the, the big thing is they just have to, there has to be more ways for them to question authority and to undermine authority. When I was a kid in, in grade school, you know, what am I, I guess it's not as popular today, but Mad Magazine, which I just thought was great from the time I was, you know, like, I think third grade on, because it was all, you know, laughing at your teacher, laughing at the politicians, laughing at the, the TV uh, newscasters, and I think, you know, when I look at all my influences, I like to say, oh, you know, it, it was, uh, Ayn Rand and John Locke and Stuart Mill, but you know, like Alfred E. Newman had a profound influence on me. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, um, get your kids to read Mad, I suppose. Yeah, I get your kids to see, read Mad, watch South Park. You know, you know, just question authority, including parents. It's like, and you know, on the one hand, and that's always a tough thing for my wife and I as, as parents, is, is we want them to be anti-authoritarian and individualist, but on the other hand, we when you're in your household and you want your kids to listen to you, it's a fine line because I, I, my kids already have developed a rebellious streak and and when I see them you know, being defiant and not listening and refusing to eat their vegetables, refusing to go to bed, you know, my wife laughs and I say, well, those, those are your kids, that's the way, that's the way you're raising them is, is to, not to listen to authority. Like, well, good thing too, I would say. <laughs> yep. Um, there's, um, of course, nothing wrong with obeying authority that you consider legitimate. Sure. And, um, yeah. Um, but uh, the, it's the mindless obedience that's being drummed into kids today that uh, is really rather frightening. Exactly. So um, for uh, parents who want their kids to, uh, to read your book and other libertarian books and for kids themselves who might be interested, how are they going to get hold of your book? Well, I, um, through any of the big websites, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, it's, it's available through um, my own website and the publisher's web website, uh, EastRiverPress.com is the uh, East River Press is the publisher, um, so you can get a lot of information about the book there and just go on Amazon and uh, as the book becomes more widely distributed, I'm hoping to get it into bookstores and have you know, media opportunities such as this one to promote it. So I'm hoping to get, uh, as for a first time author, you know, it, it's hard getting the word out and getting it into bookstores, but I'm, I'm doing what I can to um, get into the right distribution channel so that it is available widely, but at the very least Amazon has it. and. You know, just go to Amazon.com, Walton Street Tycoons. Okay, is it a, would you say it's a short, long, medium book? Uh, it's uh, 269 pages. Okay. Um, 9.95, which I think is it's a reasonable, reasonable price. Reasonable price for a paperback. And... Okay, now um, for um, a lot of us, a lot of us I think are um, aspiring authors, um, if we're not there already, uh, and would like to um, get a book published. Most people have one or two books in them at least. Um, can you tell us a little about the the mechanics of getting something published if you don't want to um, go to an agent and have them shop it around? Sure, uh, you know, and there's pros and cons to all the different ways, but uh, you can go about it and certainly an agent is a viable way to do it if you have those connections and if you get lucky. And you know, I would have loved to have my book published by uh, Random House, but you know, that wasn't in the cards. You know for reasons not least of which is that all the big New York City publishers are running run by big New York City liberals and uh, wouldn't want to publish a book like mine even if they had read it in the, in the, in the slush pile. Uh, but you know one of the great things about the age we live in is that uh, media is being disaggregated and disintermediated and so you know shows like Hard Fire that you know are direct access and, and you know, give people the the media and and websites and web publishing and but mine's a for um, a small press it's it's a you know, traditional book it's not a, a print on demand or uh, one of these digital print it's you know traditional offset printing uh, real book that you'll find in, find in the bookstore um, but there's a lot of resources today for even people that want to have a more traditional booklet which I did uh, there's a lot of uh, 
resources on the internet for, for self publishers or for small presses to um, you know do everything really it's a turnkey approach to um, you know hire people to, to do the copy editing and the proofreading and the design which I think you know it's important to have professionals do it a lot of people will do it yourself and you know that has value too if you want to you're doing it for a smaller audience you know there's certainly some and and you are a do-it-yourself type I wouldn't totally discourage that, but uh, you know, if you want a professional product, I think it's important to hire professionals. Okay, um, but um, <clears throat> if you were to um, boil the principles of libertarianism down to oh, just one or two very simple ideas that um, a kid of say twelve years old could understand, um, what would be the first maybe one or two points that you would make? Uh, the, the first point of libertarian principles is uh, you know, no aggression, no, no starting fights, no, no take anything that isn't yours. You know, that's, that's the first libertarian principle. And then, you know, the second libertarian principle is really the same thing, is you know, anything that's peaceful. Anything that you want to do, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, uh, it's your right, to, you're an individual, you own yourself, uh, and that's something that people don't get, and it sounds obvious at first, well, yeah, of course I own myself, but the implications of that are profound, and a lot of people and a lot of societies have been set up to, to recognize self-ownership. Yeah, I think that's a, a point that many people miss, that we actually do not own ourselves. We are, in effect, the property of the government or the property of the collective. Uh, maybe you can um, tell our viewers a little bit about that, because every time I bring that up to somebody, they hadn't thought of it before. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one, one of my favorite examples that, that really is, illustrates that um, is um, for feminists, who I often run into in New York, and I consider myself a, a libertarian feminist, but um, what passes for a lot of feminists in polite society is, are people that, that don't really buy the full argument that women own their bodies, uh, and especially when it comes to uh, you know, do you recognize it with something like abortion, but not so much with uh, something like prostitution? And so the, one of the old libertarian jokes is that, um, you know, we're all comfortable with the idea that a woman owns her uterus, but we think that uh, the vagina belongs to the state. <laughs> okay. That's a difficult um, thing to talk about when you're um, writing a young adult novel. But, yeah, uh, well, why not? Uh, but I know, when, I, when fact, I was in the sixth grade, there was nothing I, I like talking about more than vaginas. Oh, of course. <laughs> But um, in your in your book, without giving away too much of the plot, um, it centers around a uh, a business that um, that these fellows start up. Sure. Yeah. And um, maybe you can tell our our viewers a little bit about why businesses tend to be so overregulated and overtaxed in the first place. When did that happen? How did it happen? And how did it get so pervasive? Well, I, I think well, it's I mean, it's ebbed and flowed, but and certainly in medieval Europe, there were the, all the guilds and the mercantilist system that really you know regulated and controlled businesses, and you didn't really have a real free market uh, until the Industrial Revolution. One of the unique things about America for most of its history is that we really did largely have a free market that was unregulated, and when you started imposing you know tariffs and taxes on people, you know, you found yourself tarred and feathered and rode out of town on the, ra on the rail, you know, as well you should. And it was really that, that laissez-faire approach to, to business that uh, I think really made America prosperous for most of its history. And even the early part of the 20th century, I think it wasn't until, you know, the start of the 20th century, like you can see, you can point, you can point to, you know, uh, Theodore Roosevelt really started a lot of the uh, you know, the trust bust, trust busting and right. anti-monopoly, which really just helped set up monopolies. Um, because once the government started getting involved and all the the, the food and drug regulation, which uh, really just created a lot of barriers to entry, and that that just accelerated for the rest of the 20th century and all sorts of businesses. And while we continue to be prosperous as a nation, in a lot of ways, it's really we could be even more prosperous. Um, it's only through the ingenuity and and the resources of this country and the, and its people that that we have as much wealth. It's not. It's certainly not due to government. And you know, I think now we're starting to reach a point in our country's history where you know, will we continue to be in the twenty twenty first century as prosperous as prosperous as we were in the in the in the last? And I, I don't know. And I think if we are going to 
continue. It's, we're going to have to do a lot of this tax and regulatory system. Okay. Now, another point that um, kids are often taught uh, all through grade school and high school is the idea that um, the most wonderful thing in the world is democracy. And they get the uh, word democracy yeah. thrown in their faces, not with any clear definition of what democracy is. <coughs> They're just pretty much told that democracy in and of itself is good. Right. It's like saying the word God. It's a conversation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we totally, yeah. anti-democracy, it's the same as being anti-God or anti-motherhood. But you have a, a, a portion of your book that deals with democracy and explains why it's not always such a wonderful thing. Isn't that right? Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, I, 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 one of my favorite chapters in my book really uh, explains, you know, well, what democracy really is, and it does it in a really clever way, which I don't want to give too much away of, but uh, democracy is essentially, it's, it's no different than mob rule. It's mob rule with um, a lot of uh, trapping of civility, but it, it's, it's really one of the most uncivil things you can think of. It's, it's, I suppose, in some ways, it's better than a, mo a monarchy or a dictatorship, but it's not freedom, and people tend to, tend to equate freedom and democracy, which is not. Democracy is... It's very anti-freedom, yes, really. Yes, it's, it's, um, um, as Claire Wolf put it, you know, it's two, two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner. Right. <laughs> and, and so, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the majority lording their will over the minority, and that there's nothing freedom-loving about that. In a free society, it's the individual that, that should have the rights, and certainly the minorities that should have the rights. Um, it's, it should not be the majority getting to boss around you know, the, the minority. Exactly so. And as a matter of fact, in a democracy, it's really hard to posit that one has any rights at all. One doesn't. One only has privileges that right. can be taken away uh, at the whim of the majority. Mm. Uh, for yeah. example, uh, I pointed that out to a friend of mine who's a liberal Democrat, and she said, well, you have the right to vote. And I said, no, no, no. Voting is the right. Voting is a privilege, and it can be taken away from you. For example, if you have a felony on your record, you can't vote. Right. If you are under a certain age, you can't vote. Um, so um, Certainly, yeah. Real rights are, are either God-given or, if, if you're not a deist, they're, they're innate, natural uh, properties you're born with. The, the right to self-ownership, the right to free speech, they're, 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 they're positive rights that you have... On, on your own, regardless of what any government has to say about it. Exactly, and I think that um, that is one of the simplest ways to explain libertarianism to the uninitiated, hmm. is just to point out that there are really two opposing ideas. There are those of us who feel that you are and should be the property of the collective, and those of us who think that you're not, that you own yourself. And um, any... Um, any democratically arrived at um, law or uh, privilege that can be granted or something like that is uh, you can take that and explain to your listener why that shows that you have no rights that uh, that you are actually owned by the government. Right. Take one for example. Go ahead. Sorry, is one, of, one of the misnomers that that I always cringe at is when people say, "Well, well, the uh, Bill of Rights gives you the right to do this," or. The Constitution gives you the right to do that. Say, no, no, no. Read, read the thing. The Constitution does not give you any rights. If you look at the way it's all worded, it's all worded in the negative. The, the Congress shall not infringe. The Congress shall pass a law infringing on your right. It's all, and because the, the founders understood that these are rights that you were born with, and the the Bill of Rights is really it's properly understood as a Bill of Prohibitions. It's all prohibitions on the government infringing on the rights that you had before the government ever came along. Exactly. So, and I think that. Um, some people, including, frankly, some people who call themselves libertarians, will um, misinterpret and abuse the uh, Bill of Rights for their own purposes. For example, um, if I am holding a meeting and somebody else tries to disturb it, and I ask the cops to come over and please get this guy out of there, then he will complain that his rights to free speech are being violated. I'm, and I have to explain, no, this is not the Congress making a law restricting your speech. This is me as a private citizen yeah. saying, don't disrupt my meeting. Right. You're but, exercising your right to free association. Exactly I don't want so. to associate with this person on my private property. And I am not mm -hmm. under any obligation to provide this man with a podium from which to speak. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, and it's prohibitions on government. Yeah. Um, editors and publishers obviously don't have any obligation to, to facilitate your, your freedom of the press, mm -hmm. you, you get your own press. <laughs> yeah. Another point that I think is very important to bring up, especially when you're explaining this to children, is that um, with rights certainly come responsibilities, oh, but it, 
they are not responsibilities to the collective, as so many socialists and liberals would have us believe. No, your responsibilities are to your fellow individual right. on an individual basis. And there's also being responsible for the consequences of your actions, and which is something a lot of people today aren't prepared for, and which the schools and, and society do a lot to drum out of the kids, is that you know, if, if you screw up, it's okay, we'll take care of you, we'll, we'll help pick you up. And you know, in a free society, well, yeah, maybe your neighbors would, will help you if you get yourself in a jam and you're a good person, but they won't enable a way of life of screwing up. If you, if you continue to make bad choices for yourself, you're the, part of that res responsibility is the responsibility to take the consequences of your bad choices. Right. Uh, another uh, uh, bone of contention, as far as I'm concerned, is this idea that you have to perform some sort of community service as a condition of graduation. Uh, in effect, taking volunteerism and making it compulsory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's absurd, and uh, yeah, and just and again, it's just part of that conditioning that yeah, you you are part of this thing larger than yourself, and, and more important than yourself, the collective, which is just completely antithetical to traditional American values and really to any decent sense of morality that that you're a slave of the, of this larger collective. Yeah, and I think that obviously the moral that we can draw from that is teach your children well, don't rely on the school system to do it, don't rely on society to do it. You ultimately are responsible for teaching your children the proper values. Exactly. And um, I guess one of the best ways to do that is to um, buy the um, book that has recently been written by my guest and which will be out this winter, The Walton Street Tycoons by Jim Lashinsky available on Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com and um, various other outlets. Thank you very much, Jim, for my uh, being my guest tonight. And thank you all for tuning in. And we will see you next week on the next edition of Hard Fire. Catering for the cast and crew of Hard Fire is generously provided by Da Vincenzo Restaurant, 256 Prospect Park West, Brooklyn, New York, 11215. 718-369-3590. www.davincenzorestaurant.com. That's a difficult um, thing to talk about when you're um, writing a young adult novel. But, yeah, but, uh, uh, but I know, when, I, when fact, I was in the sixth grade, there was nothing I like, like talking about more than vaginas. <laughs>